Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa Chavet, the Business Development Manager at Charity Digital, and I'll be your host for today's session, which will give you the tools you need, uh, you, yourself, your teams, and your organizations to be more cyber secure. Uh, for those of you are, who are regulars, it's good to have you back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, we really, really hope that you will find today's sessions about cybersecurity very valuable um, and that you will share it widely with the rest of the organizations. Um, Joel Hogan is our programs manager at Charity Digital, and he will present um, the, this uh, very insightful session uh, for approximately half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and then we will have a Q&A session uh, where we'll be joined by our partners from the National Cybersecurity Center. Joel will delve into the basic definition of cybersecurity, um, share, informa share information gained uh, from the NCSC and other allies uh, across the charity sector. So he put that all together so you don't have to, uh, uh, to look for uh, all the information. Everything is, is in this slide. So you can expect to learn about the best behaviors to, to prevent cyber attacks, how to react to breaches, how to educate your teams, and, and much more. Um, let us know where you're joining us from um, in the meantime. Uh, and before we start, I'm just gonna share a few house rules for all, all of you here today. Um, this session will be recorded. Um, so the recording of the sessions, the slides and all the other resources will be made available to you in approximately uh, a, a week or, or less than a week. So you can refer to ring and share it with the rest of your, of your colleagues. Closed captions are available on the bottom right of your screen next to the record button if you need them. As I said earlier, we will have plenty of time to answer all of your questions. So it's really, really important that you, you, you don't abstain from, from asking it at any time during the presentation. And we'll leave about 15, 15 minutes towards the end uh, um, of, of our hour together to answer all of them. Um, the Q&A section is the two speech bubbles overlapping one another. You can upvote for your favorite questions in the same section, which is great. And then the chat function is for everything else to tell us where you're joining us from, uh, to tell us more about your role, um, your, your organization, you know, what you do and what you're looking to get out of today's session. Uh, we always love uh, to hear from all of you. So, so we're really looking forward to seeing the, 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 the chat section buzzing. Uh, once you leave the webinar session, you'll be prompted for feedback. Um, so please do leave your comments and, and feedback and that will help us put together some great presentation in the future. Um, as I said, please ask all of your questions. We'll be joined with uh, about by um, uh, one of our uh, friends at the NCSC later on. And uh, without further ado, let me hand over to Joel. Hi, Joel. Hi, Lisa. Lovely warm hand over as always. So thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing extremely well. I know that I am. Um, so let's get started with this. So if you go on the next slide, please. Great. So. What is cyber security? So let's get this ready. So cyber security means protecting computer systems and networks from theft, damage, and other forms of criminal activity. Now, strong cyber security is essential to the charity sector. It protects you against the loss of revenue, reputational damage, financial disruption, and much more too. In this webinar, we want to give you the tools to protect yourself from cyber criminals and allow you to fulfill your mission without disruption. We explore, among so many other things, the, uh, the basic definition of cybersecurity, the reasons you need cybersecurity, how to prevent cyber attacks, how to react to cyber breaches, how to educate your team, and more. So without further ado, here is everything you need to know about cybersecurity. Next slide, please. So in simple terms, cybersecurity is the protection of your computer systems and networks from theft or damage. Next slide, please. The cybersecurity protects and secures hardware and software, electronic data, and other parts of your network too, but as well. And it's just ensuring there's no disruption or misdirection in the services they provide. And next slide, please. 
So cybersecurity provides protection against uh, malicious attacks designed to access, alter, uh, delete, destroy or extort sensitive data. And um, it's designed to prevent cyber criminals from the following. So gaining access to computer systems without authorization, infecting systems with viruses or other malware, uh, which would enable them to steal or modify or delete data, or use that ability to extort organizations as well. Uh, also tricking computer users into submitting data, payment details or other confidential data as well and also preventing customers from accessing computer systems by overloading them or uh, diverting data traffic away from them, uh, usually with the aim of holding the organization ransom. Now, these are the main ways in which cyber uh, criminals operate. We'll cover the exact terminology and the exact forms of attack a little later. Next slide, please. Okay. The cybersecurity is important because our devices have become essential to our, our ability to live, deliver services, uh, raise funds and um, continue our daily operations. Uh, any act that prevents our ability to use devices uh, poses a serious threat to our organizations and cybercrime is certainly a threat. Uh, now let's look at some uh, stati uh, statistics. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so exactly two thirds, so 66% of organizations report that a cyber attack would affect their operations. And uh, only 61% have a plan in place in the event of such an attack. 78% uh, of trustees said they were unaware of the cyber strategy within their organization. And only 5% of charities are using comprehensive cybersecurity software to protect themselves. Now this shows that charities are broadly aware of the threat of attack but uh, seeming to, seemingly uh, do very little to prevent that threat. Uh, there is an awareness of cyber crime, uh, but few charities taking it as seriously as they should. And that is a problem. And that's particularly widespread uh, in the charity sector. So the reality is that cyber attacks can be devastating. Um, let's take a look at three of the main consequences of cyber attack, highlighting exactly why your organization needs to adopt a robust cyber security. So next slide, please. Oh yeah, okay, already there. <laughs> Should we go back to, yeah. So, thank you. Cyber attacks can compromise the data of service users, volunteers, supporters, uh, donors, and uh, other stakeholders. Now, that is particularly harmful to the reputation of charities, uh, largely because charities operate on trust. And uh, the loss of trust, uh, it can result in a few sort of fewer donations, uh, skepticism from the service users, uh, less volunteers like wanting to take part in your organization or help you out and, um, and a broader unwillingness to just engage with your charity as a whole. Uh, your customers will be angry, distressed, upset their data has been stolen, uh, perhaps leaving them to actually cut ties with your charity entirely, um, tell their family and friends, perhaps report it to newspapers or show on, this, on social media, for example, as well. Now, employees may lose faith in their organisation, uh, if their data is breached, and uh, service users may feel unsure about using the charity, uh, given the organisation's failure to protect privacy. Now, funders um, could be turned away uh, from working with your charity and granting any much needed funds if your charity is perceived to be uh, negligent or untrustworthy uh, when it comes to cyber security. Grant, fund, uh, grant funders like to know charities are doing their due diligence, uh, sorry, due diligence <laughs> in all areas, and that includes robust cyber security. So if approaching a funder, it will form part of your first impression. In short, charities need robust cybersecurity to protect their reputation. They need to ensure that all stakeholders and users feel safe working with them and can trust that their data is secure. The um, cybersecurity market has grown in uh, recent years, uh, largely because of the monetary impact of cybercrime. Uh, charities continue to fall victim to cyber attacks, uh, partly because they believe it will not happen to them, uh, partly because criminals know they will not. Uh, 
they're not well protected and partly because charities have a much harder time uh, justifying the expenditure on cyber security products. Now, cyber criminals will always find an aspect of your organisation to expose, whether it is for monetary costs or even if it is for pure trolling, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's not a matter of if, it is when you'll be breached in many occasions. The expense is justified. Uh, because cyber attacks themselves are very expensive, the average cost of uh, a data breach in 2021 was £4.24 million. And that's according to IBM's cost of a data breach report. Uh, the costs, um, they come down in many forms, um, but theft of financial information, uh, disruption to daily operations, loss of funds and donations, and asking for ransoms are all common tactics. Now, um, small charities need to be particularly aware of the monetary costs. Uh, cybercrime disproportionately hits small organisations. Uh, the financial impact to large companies may be huge. Uh, based on the scale, the implications are relatively minimal. Small charities, on the other hand, face an ex existential uh, threat due to uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so they need to ensure that they are very well protected. In terms of legal consequences, I mean, finally, it's worth mentioning uh, uh, with the legal consequences, which often follow in addition to all of the, uh, the information I've just spoken about. Uh, data protection and privacy laws require organisations to secure personal data. Uh, that could be the data of your employees, uh, service users, your donors, or any other person related to your organisation. If your organisation's data is compromised, and you have failed to employ effective cyber security measures. You may face fines or sanctions, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, of course. In short, uh, you may lose money through the cyber breach and you may face organisational disruption and reputational damage. You may lose your user data and then face fines on top of all of that, as I've just spoken about as well. Uh, next slide, please. So there are various types of cyber attack, um, so all of which provide different levels of threat, including malware, ransomware, which is a form of malware, uh, phishing and denial of service attacks. Next slide, please. Thank you. So there are many potential uh, gateways that cyber criminals could make use of. So for example, um, <clears throat> so unpatched vulnerabilities uh, when software updates are not installed, or bugs are unfixed, uh, they provide an opportunity for cyber criminals to gain access to your networks. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, networks. They could also hack your password, uh, hence the importance of a robust password policy uh, to password managers and a multi factor authentication. Uh, the NCS, uh, NCSC uh, recommends using three random words. You can write your passwords down, but don't share online. Verify where requests uh, come from before sharing anything with colleagues via email. An email from the CEO is a common tactic used by cyber criminals using authority uh, to lead someone into sharing sensitive information. Uh, let's run through some of the most common tactics uh, to give you all the necessary information you might need. Uh, so next slide, please. So phishing is one of the most devastating weapons that cyber criminals use to get their hands on your charity's data, uh, infect computers with malware, um, steal money, more obviously. Phishing is perhaps the cyber attack with which we are most familiar. Uh, criminals send emails, uh, texts, uh, other comms as well, um, attempting to trick employees or users into clicking on bad links. Um, downloading malware, of course, or uh, taking them to um, uh, dodgy websites. <laughs> um, now, it's a form of uh, social engineering and is often very easy to spot. With the right training and awareness, but has become increasingly sophisticated in recent years. The key to protection is simply practicing caution and knowing potential signs of phishing messages. They usually rely on uh, five tactics, which is urgency, authority, emotion, scarcity and current events. So you might receive an email ostensibly from your CEO asking you to perform a task for them quickly, appealing to your sense of uh, authority and urgency. Uh, 
uh, think that, thinking that you must act swiftly or face reprimand, you might click the link or reply to the email without noticing its legit uh, legitimacy or origins. Next slide, please. So a denial of service attack works by driving large amounts of internet traffic to a web server until it is overwhelmed. And the result is that legitimate users um, who want to use your site are unable to, which causes significant damage, of course. Now consider, for example, uh, that supporters may be unable to donate, um, service users unable to use resources, and general trust in your organization might plummet as well. A DOS attack is the digital equivalent of getting thousands of people to call a company's phone line at the same time over a sustained period. And the result would be that ordinary, uh, ordinary customers would be unable to get through because of the phone number and it would be permanently engaged. A more intense form of DOS attack is the distributed denial of service attack or DDOS. While DOS attacks usually come from a small number of attacking systems and are therefore relatively easy to block, DDoS attackers use thousands of internet users um, to each generate a small number of requests, which added together overload the target, of course. These participants may either be willing uh, accomplices, uh, such as attacks initiated by loosely organized illegal hacktivist groups, or unwitting victims whose machines have been affected, uh, infected with malware. The biggest danger of DOS and DDoS attacks is that they happen without warning. So it is much more difficult for organizations to prepare for them, but not impossible. Next slide, please. Ransomware is a type of malware that infects end user computers as well as servers. Once on a computer, ransomware silently encrypts all the files on the computer or just certain types of files such as databases, uh, spreadsheets and documents. Ransomware then locks your device and, then in, and the encrypted files become inaccessible. A ransom note then demands payment, um, usually in the form of a type of cryptocurrency, uh, for the decryption key needed to restore access. In many cases, the funds are taken and uh, the files are not decrypted or they are provided a key which doesn't work. It's very, very common. Most ransomware also seeks out connections from an infected computer to other computers so that a single infection can lead to a large number of devices uh, becoming quickly infected. Next slide, please. Okay, so how to mitigate cyber attacks. Next slide. There are two elements of cybersecurity that organizations need to consider around cyber attacks, preventing them from happening and reacting appropriately when they do happen. The first is the most essential as adequate cybersecurity will give you a high chance of never experiencing a cyber attack and never having to put the second element into action. Preventative measures are essential and the more preventative measures you take, the better. According to the state of cybersecurity in the UK charity sector, more than one in 10 charities are using antivirus software, software only. But our level of connectivity means that viruses and malware are more advanced and don't only infect one computer. They can infect all of our devices connected to it too. Uh, using password managers uh, to decrease the risk of forgetting unique passwords for accounts, uh, VPN, patch management and endpoint protection software, or indeed the works, uh, charities can ensure that they are as protected as possible from cyber threats wherever they come from. Next slide, please. Knowledge is power. So if you know the signs of the cybersecurity threat, you can start to defend against them. Charities should ensure that they share all cybersecurity knowledge internally so that everyone knows the risks and can identify a potential cyber attack. The more eyes that look out for risks, the more likely we are to catch them. Organizations need to ensure all staff are clued up on cybersecurity protocol, like regularly updating their software um, to patch uh, any security vulnerabilities and how to spot a phishing attack. This is especially important now people are working from home and on their own devices. So cybersecurity training is invaluable uh, for this and doesn't have to be costly. Uh, try the NCSC's free e-learning course, uh, which puts you and your staff in the driving seat, answering questions, 
identifying possible issues and making suggestions for how to prevent and tackle common cybersecurity challenges. Next slide, please. Preventive measures are brilliant, but an unfortunate fact remains, no one is safe from cyber criminals. Even the most tech savvy, even the most well prepared can fall victim to a cyber attack. Best way to prevent serious damage is to ensure that you react quickly and efficiently, preferably in, uh, enacting a plan that you have already devised. As with any crisis, time is of the essence and it's important that everyone in your organisation knows their responsibilities in the event of a cyber breach so you can respond to it quickly and effectively. The NCSC Cyber Aware Action Plans can help charities come up with a dedicated cybersecurity plan which can especially uh, help small charities without a dedicated cybersecurity professional. Answering just a few questions about your organization on the NCSC website, will get you access to a free personalized list of actions to help improve your cybersecurity. Next slide, please. If you are attacked, ensure to report this action, uh, report this to Action Fraud and the NCSC. You can report fraud or cybercrime to action fraud any time of the day or night uh, using our online reporting tool. Uh, the tool will guide you through simple questions to identify what has happened and advisors are available 24 hours a day uh, to help give you help and advice if you need it. Uh, you can also report to action fraud by calling their helpline. Um, if your organisation is right in the middle of a cyber attack, you can also call Action Fraud at any time, day or night for support. Uh, so the ICO under GDPR rules, charities must report a data breach uh, to the ICO within 72 hours of becoming aware of it, unless you demonstrate that it's unlikely to result in a risk to individuals' rights and freedoms. You should report personal data breaches relating to a cyber incident online at www ico.org.uk. If, however, you cannot access your systems, uh, your report can be made via the ICO's helpline, which is open Monday to Friday between nine till five. And, uh, the sooner you contact the ICO, the better. Uh, if needed, you can report in instalments and give updates when you'll get more information. Now, reporting an incident to the NCSC does not fulfill any legal or regulator regulatory incident reporting requirements but the NCSC has the power to investigate and take down scam email addresses and websites. Charities can forward suspected phishing emails to them at report at phishing.gov.uk. Uh, reporting a scam is free and only takes a minute. Uh, by reporting phishing attempts, you can reduce the amount of scam communications you receive, uh, make yourself a harder target for scammers, and also protect others from cyber uh, cyber crime online. It's also important that uh, to let know, the, know those affected too. I'll say my word today, <laughs> and you should let them know as soon as possible if you need to take action, like changing passwords. Uh, later, once you have all the information and the breach is contained, you should communicate what has happened in an open and sincere manner. Admitting the mistakes you made, uh, the reasons why the criminals were able to breach your systems, and any steps you plan to take to support people affected by the data breach. Next slide, please. So, Charity Digital Survey, the state of cybersecurity in the UK charity sector, revealed that only 5% of charities use cybersecurity software to stay secure, including password managers and VPNs. Worse still, so many charities are failing to employ freely available tools and resources that will help them effectively improve cybersecurity. Um, so we note just we know that just some of the tools and resources that your charity can use uh, with some brief descriptions to help you find the right bits for you. So for the NCSC, the NCSC supports the most uh, critical organisations in the UK, the public sector, industries, SMEs, SMEs, yep, charities and the general public. When incidents do occur, the NCSC provides effective incident response to minimise harm to the UK, uh, help with recovery and learn lessons for the future. Uh, more specifically, the NCSC distills knowledge of cyber into practical guidance that we make available to all. Uh, responds to incidents to reduce the harm they cause to organisations and the wider UK. Uh, 
uh, use its industry and uh, academic expertise to nurture the UK's cybersecurity capability, uh, reduces risks to the UK by securing public and private sector networks. So you can find guidance for types of attack, uh, how to respond to them, and much more on the NCSC website. And uh, if you have any questions uh, today, the NCSC will be on hand at the end to answer them. Um, much of the government's Get Safe Online website is aimed at the general public, uh, but its business section includes a large number of comprehensive explanatory uh, overviews on many aspects of data security. The terms. Get Safe Online includes a wealth of information in one place and in plain English. Uh, on the main regulations, uh, different types of security tax and risks, types of scams and attacks, uh, hardware and software information, and a section on guidelines for charities uh, with an overview of the specific responsibilities and risks and what to do if you're a victim of fraud. Now, the IASME Governance, Sta Governance Standard have, was created during a government funded project to create a cyber security standard easily affordable to small organization and as a much more achievable standard to the international ISO 27001. IASME uh, assesses and certifies organizations against two standards at both the self-assessment and audited levels with specific certifications in cyber essentials for the health and social sector and certifications in GDPR. Now our charities can use cyber essentials a readiness tool uh, to see if they have the five core controls necessary to prevent a cyber attack and become cyber certified. You can also download a copy of the standard on their website, which is aimed at helping organizations understand their risk profile in detail and see the typical test that you'll need to, be, uh, you'll need to pass uh, to be certified. And charities, uh, they should particularly take note of the Cyber Essentials Charity Week in November, where charity specific guidance is shared and a discount is offered for accreditation. Charity Digital Exchange uh, software uh, donation program has been helping charities save money on essential software for more than 18 years. Uh, registered charities can receive as much as a 96% discount off the retail price for soft of software, including uh, popular security tools uh, uh, as well. Uh, we also host um, webinars and publish guidance to support the charity sector in their quest to improve cybersecurity. Uh, we have an upcoming webinar that will run through the basics as posted um, as well and various articles, podcasts and videos to help you navigate the complexities. Next slide, please. The NCSC has plenty of tools. Uh, first, you can use the, um, the web check, which was developed by the NCSC to check for vulnerabilities on your website. Now, organizations can put URLs into the tool and they'll check for a myriad of issues, such as whether your uh, server software is up to date, patched, uh, whether any links to third party sites are secure, and uh, whether there are any issues with a service certificate chain. Next slide, please. The MailCheck tool helps you to understand the security of your email configuration server. The tool covers two areas of email security, um, anti-spoofing and email privacy as well. It protects your systems with the anti-spoofing controls so criminals can't send emails pretending to come from your charity. The tool teaches you about anti-spoofing controls and helps you identify and fix email sending systems so they can be trusted while ensuring that the legitimate emails are delivered. Next slide, please. The early warning tool is designed to give organizations a heads up that there might be a problem with their cybersecurity that needs addressing. The tool filters millions of events every day and it links any potential threats to an organization's IP address and domain names. It notifies them so issues can be investigated and mitigated and essentially uh, early warning matches data from its information feeds to data given by the potential victim organization and helps them prevent a breach before it starts. Next slide, please. You can read more about the free tools from the NCSC, what to do in the event of a cybersecurity attack, and the state of cybersecurity 
in the UK sector uh, report on charity Dig digital. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Joel, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, yes, it was it was really insightful, and we really hope that you all of you took took a few notes or or had some some ideas already. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, we can dive straight into questions. So um, as always, please feel free to ask all of your questions. We're going to have uh, a good uh, 15, 15 minutes to 20 minutes to answer them. So um, please do not hesitate to uh, to pop them in the Q&A section. And I think we will also be joined uh, by uh, one representative from the National Cyber, Cyber Security Center, Becca Kay, uh, Charity Cyber Resilience Lead. Um, and uh, she will be also very happy to, to answer all of the all of our audience questions. So I will I will actually dive straight in because we have quite a few. <laughs> and hi, Becca. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me in. I, I just caught the end of, of the presentation. It sounds like it was really comprehensive and, and covered a lot for everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. I can only see the questions that have come up since I joined. So oh, fire yeah, away, yeah, uh, yes. I know what you want me to answer first. <laughs> um, um, yeah, let's see how we go. Uh, brilliant. Well, let, let, let's dive straight in. Um, so a question from David um, asking about email digital signatures that have been around for decades, but never really caught on. Um, considering phishing attacks and social engineering, could internal digital signatures be a useful tool to reconsider? Um, well, the, the NCSC actually recommends that you um, you're monitoring your your email system. Um, so we're looking at um, a, what they call a DMARC policy. So that's the policy on how you know how you monitor the emails coming in and out. Because actually, um, a criminal could go onto the system and start sending out emails from using your domain, your email address, mm -hmm. making it look very much like it's an email from you without realizing it. Um, so the free the the, the mail check tool that we have mm -hmm. that's that's free that's what we would recommend that you use this will help you to set up your dmox your dmox settings so they would recommend that you start with a monitor and actually see what's going in and out first um, and then that can help you to def to define how far you want to take it um, i can't remember what all of the different um settings are but it will help to reduce the amount of spam coming in to your um to your in volunteers and your staff but also reduce the chances of anything coming out so there were you wouldn't um, necessarily need the digital signatures so much with with that system in place mm -hmm. we have actually had charities that have come back um a large charity came back to us and they had put it put uh, their dmoc settings onto monitor using mailcheck and i think within a month they had over 100,000 emails that had been coming out. They haven't been aware that it happened. Obviously, as soon as they're aware, they, they could stop it. Um, and I think it's that, it's that awareness, isn't it? No. I think if you put in yeah. the, the signatures in, you're not getting that awareness. You're not, you're not doing the monitoring to understand actually how, whether there's a, whether, whether there's yes, a situation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wow. and, and I think, yeah. And then when you look at one of the most um, common ways that a criminal comes into gets into your system is through someone clicking on a link on a phishing link. email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so, so having that in place, it doesn't mitigate the awareness that um, your staff and your volunteers need to have because it's not 100 percent guaranteed that it's going to stop everything. Um, but it's, it it's be a good help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it takes it takes a little bit of time to set it up, but um, though you can contact the NCSC to help you with that as well. So we have got some experts on hand that will really that that are great, and they'll give you you know a bit of time. Or if we're getting a lot of requests from charities, we can set up a workshop, help people to work mm -hmm. through their settings. Do work through that. I think that's really important for charities as well because people trust an email that comes from a charity. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. we want to help charities. Most most normal people not criminals you know want to, they want to do their best for a charity don't they and and you trust something that comes through and, and you you respond from your heart you know you mm -hmm. respond quite quickly and they go yes oh, I, I'm really passionate about this cause I want to give you all my money um, 
and that's what they rely on really um you know the goodness of people's hearts unfortunately unfortunately yeah but yeah thank you thank you becca for, right. for that for that answer um another question um and yeah please don't don't forget that you can upvote for your most favorite question so uh one that we received and um would you recommend working with a third party it provider to help with cyber security um, so it certainly can help if you don't mm -hmm. have in-house IT, you know, IT expertise, but you've just got to remember that it's your responsibility to make sure that they are putting things in place, the right things in place mm -hmm. for you. Um, so at least start off with the small charity guides um, and from there, start to think about what are the things that you care about and what are the things that you need to put in place, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about the data that you hold. You know, we have a responsibility through GDPR to make sure that we're keeping that data safe. Um, and so I wouldn't. So, yes, use, a, use an IT provider, but it's your responsibility to make sure that you're signing up to the services that um, that you need. Yeah. And, and it's yeah, your responsibility you to be checking on them as well and making yeah. sure that they're doing that. Yeah. yeah. And holding <laughs> and but most importantly, holding your uh, IT supplier accountable. Uh, so yeah. so knowing knowing what what to what to ask uh, of them and, and having a way to to check whether uh, all of that is is being um, is being done. And and I'm, I'm pretty sure we yeah. could spend another another presentation going through uh, the sort of uh, checklists that that you need to ask a uh, uh, provider. Joel, I don't know if you wanted to add um, any Anything to, to that answer that question? Yeah, it, it is obviously it can be tricky, especially for smaller charities bringing in um, uh, external IT companies just from a budget side of things as well, especially the way that we're world is at the moment. So we have tools, uh, at least a starting point is to use some of some of these free tools uh, from the NCSC before feeling you need to make take that step into employing an external IT company or maybe extending your own budget to maybe bring your own in-house person in instead and maybe even make it more trusted that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both. Um, moving on to to following question. Um, Rachel is asking whether uh, we can recommend good training videos for end users about security habits when they're using their own devices for charity purposes. So any um, good resources or training videos? Well, we have we have the NCSC's e-learning as well. We have top tips for staff, which is mm -hmm. a really great, um, really great learning. You can it's um, I can't remember the type of file it is, but it's a type of file that you can download onto your system if you have it, or you can direct people to the NCSC website to um, to sign up for it, to to sign up and do it there. And then we also have one um, for small charities. So if you, there's only a couple of you, you could do do that so that's a really great place to start because it helps to just give them that awareness the basics. Um, yeah. we're not allowed to recommend particular suppliers unfortunately but that's a great first step and it's free and then if you feel that you need to do more around that then then maybe think about how you can um how else you can improve that culture in the charity um it doesn't necessarily have to be through training it could be through, I mean, if you sign up to the small organisations newsletter that we have, and I'll try and put a link into mm -hmm. it. Um, if you sign up to the newsletter every month, there's some some great um, articles in there, like little uh, like myth busters and things like that. And you can send that out to people and just get people still thinking about it. Um, and re really important that you don't... Um, Tell people, tell people off you know if they make a mistake we're all humans and I think having that culture that's that embraces it and says well thank you for being honest and raising it um they're more likely to then let you know if a mistake's happened mm -hmm. and less likely for, for that impact to be so big as well um so as well as thinking about the training thinking about that culture more widely um and, you know, maybe if there is someone in senior in your charity that has clicked on a link by mistake, just be totally honest about it and be mm -hmm. open and share that. And then that will help people realise that it can be anyone that can, can be click anyone. on it. Absolutely. You know, we, we're all we're all human. Um, I think on our NCSC website, um, our technical directory in Levy, someone tried to spoof him and he nearly got caught as well. And I mean, he is like... The, the god of cybersecurity, and uh, even he nearly got caught. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
so so no, no, definitely um yes yeah, it's, it's it's very important i think the the element of the the no blame culture element um people yeah. shouldn't be afraid um you know of you know coming forward and saying yeah i've, I've done this and, and i've done that um and uh because the earlier uh it is it is known the the better um so so yeah definitely um Moving on, a question from Rosaline. Um, she's asking whether we'd recommend purchasing cybersecurity insurance. Okay, that's a really interesting question um, because I'm, I'm, well, we're just in the process of developing a new threat report for the for the charity sector to help us and and the charity sector to understand, you know, where where charities are particularly more vulnerable. And one thing that came up. Was that there's a much lower level of cyber insurance in the charity sector than anywhere else. I mean, it's less than half. Um, it was quite significant. And um, the reason why we would be concerned about this is because of the impact that a cyber attack might have on a charity. Um, if you think about the fact that we've had, we've had COVID, we're now in a recession, you know, we're seeing funding going down a lot. And so the cost, the, the impact of recovering from a cyber attack could be really, really great. Mm. And there are many benefits for cyber insurance. It's not just the fact that they all help to cover like the costs, but also to actually, uh, to get the cyber insurance, you'll have to have certain measures in place. So it helps you to become accountable for putting those measures in place in the first, it, before you even get the insurance. <laughs> And then a lot of these insurance companies as well, when you are, a, unfortunately, hopefully not, won't be, but if you are a victim of a cyber attack, you can contact them and they can help to, help to guide you through it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps to reduce the impact um, of an attack. If you sign up for Cyber Essentials, if you get Cyber Essentials, um, and I can't remember the threshold of the, the amount of income that an organisation needs, but I think it's under if you if it's under five million pounds, if it has an income of under five million, I think, don't quote me on it, you get free cyber insurance. Mm. The added bonus mm. is that this is an organization that the NCSC has engaged with, and we know that the insurance um is appropriate and, and will have a good impact as well. So that's something that you could consider is is getting cyber essentials to then get the cyber insurance associated with it. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you, Becca. Um, and uh, yeah, moving on. Uh, question from Romena. Um, what would you say is really an approximate cost for small organizations to get sufficient security? Um, and yeah, I might maybe ask the question first to, to Joel, if he can give us a, an overview from a tech, tech perspective. What would he say? Oh, you're muted, I think. There we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rookie move. <laughs> I, I mean, I hate to push a question back, but first it determines on your size of your charity as well. Mm. Um, but in speak as broadly as possible, you want to look at the, the quantity of devices that you, you're you using. And I'm not just saying in a physical office as well. I'm sure many people here are in the form of hybrid working with one sense or another. Do you need to ensure that you can protect um, all the devices that are associated with your organisation with mobile wires in an office and that type of words work thing as well. Um, the costs, um, there, there are sort of many discounts out there uh, for charities. I won't go into specifics on this webinar, but there are many um, sort of discounted offers. Um, sometimes it, it can go sometimes maybe six or seven pounds per license, uh, sorry, per device in some places, sometimes even less than that, depends on your offer and who you go with um, as well. But I think the main way is uh, just to echo Becca's thoughts earlier, you know, it's a, the, the time now where we're in a recession and going through COVID, we really need to expand, uh, sorry, we, need, we really need to think about cybersecurity is more than just an overhead. It's essential to the way of life for your organisation to grow and, and, and continue. Um, and yeah, and, it, and ultimately it will help you achieve your mission as well. Like, and it will certainly cost you less money um if you are attacked absolutely. Um, without the um the uh, protection absolutely thank you joel um becca i don't know if you wanted to add more to that uh, answer yeah um and i think i agree that there is no sort of stock answer for this and it really depends on the not just the size but i think also the work that you're doing as well 
um, if you're um, working with vulnerable people or if you're holding um, what GDPR classes sensitive data, so whether that's data on, on, on people's political beliefs or the sexual orientation or medical um, records, data, yeah. you know, all of those sorts of things, you have an added responsibility there. And, and, and that will cost, that will cost more. Mm -hmm. um, so have a look and think about what, you know, what the base, the baseline shouldn't cost you too much money. So if you have a look at the small charity guide, really good place to start. And um, probably the, the, the main thing that would cost you the money there would be using backups. Mm -hmm. You can use the cloud. So it depends on how much data that you have that you need to back up. Um, you know, as a, as a first start, only back up the data that you feel is really, really important to you. Also make sure that your passwords are different to your backup. You know, the, the um, just making sure that um, you're putting those basics in place, using the two-factor authentication, making sure people are using strong passwords, using different passwords for um, systems that are really important to you, like your, like have a separate password to your email, have a separate password to access the, uh, the data. Um, make sure that you're limiting the access to the data. So only the people that really need to access it actually do have that access. And um, yeah, make sure it's really easy for people to report something that, that they've spotted. You know, if you just put all of those things in place before you even spend money, that, I mean, that, that would really, really help. Exactly. No, I agree. Um, I was and, say, actually, uh, that's something yeah. Becca said something really interesting there about GDPR. Mm. Um, so we, in terms of cybersecurity uh, products and software out there, um, they're not always designed with GDPR in mind, um, obviously, because not every country or section of the world is falls under GDPR law. So for those who, particularly those who handle sensitive data, um, you might want to double check Sort of with the provider um, if it's sort of designed for GDPR in mind. Um, there are many organisations out there who might have particular plans with uh, GDPR in mind, uh, perhaps a way of how to store your data correctly. And if there's someone was to ever ask for their data from you or something like that, you can send it to them um, as well. So it's, it's definitely worth bearing that in mind that not everything is designed with GDPR in mind protection wise. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for that, for that precision, Joel. And actually that leads us to a very, uh, to, to a very closely related question from David. Um, how would an organization determine whether a cyber attack also breached GDPR um, and personal data protection? Maybe it's a question for maybe you, Becca, to start with. Yes. So, um, it can it can be difficult to know whether mm. or not and if in any doubt report that to the information commissioner's office um quite often with um for example a ransomware attack the the, the uh, i don't know if you see them in the you know in um movies and things like that this hop up up comes you've been attacked give us your money but on there, it can also say we have uploaded your your data um and of course you know, <laughs> if in doubt if you're not sure go for it. You can also use free logging tools so you can actually look back and see what activity has been happening as well. Um, so you can look back and see whether or not you have seen data that's been mm -hmm. uh, uploaded. Um, yeah, it's uh, if in doubt, report report it um, and then they do investigations and find out whether or not it did. Um, but yeah, it can mm. be a difficult one, especially if you're not tech, if you're, if you know, if you're not tech savvy, it's, it is a bit of a it's difficult a question. Mm. So sometimes, yeah, maybe, maybe giving yourself a peace of mind of using the third party um, provider yeah. mm -hmm. you know, provides that you can go and ask and say, I don't know, has data been exfiltrated? I'm, I'm not really sure. And then, and then get them to help you. Also, perhaps even the cyber insurance um, providers would be able to help you with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, there is there are there are ways and means and if you're not sure get an expert report it um you can report to the ico and it turns out that there's no data that's been exfiltrated that's absolutely fine um yeah, better yeah. safe than sorry i'd say yeah it's like when, it's like going mm. to the doctors it's better to be safe than sorry mm -hmm. isn't it go and get it checked out <laughs> mm -hmm. no absolutely um but thank you um moving on to a uh, question from tim what is the current advice on using antivirus and all the security software on apple system and and imac um 
I can leave that question to either of you, perhaps uh, Becca to start with and then Joel. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I know I'm not sure not I know what the exact advice is on antivirus mm. from Apple I mean I, I I do understand that they are seeing more and more vulnerabilities coming through on on Apple and I'm an iMacs and you know Apple products mm -hmm. um, I I'm not an Apple user but I use antivirus and I probably would do if I had mm -hmm. Apple but I think the risks are are a little bit lower using them um, I think if you're using it for work I would if you're just using your device for home maybe Make don't it, worry yeah. about it as much but if you're using your home device to access work then perhaps you need to be considering offering antivirus to help and help maybe may even some sort of patch management of some description as well to make sure that people are automatically updating their software <laughs> <laughs> and it can be really difficult for charities as well because far more likely for individuals to be using their own devices for work it's so difficult to manage that if it's um if it's all managed in-house you know you can you can make sure that devices are patched within 14 days of an update and that sort of thing um also you can't really um monitor what kind of apps people are using what websites they're going to as well so perhaps give you that peace of mind um, encourage everyone <laughs> um, just put antivirus just fund oh, antivirus no. on people's yeah. devices might be a really good thing to do whether it's apple or not mm -hmm. absolutely joel yeah big gone on the days i remember growing up and people used to say apple well it never gets never gets viruses i remember that's what they used to say growing up and long gone are those days um the only thing i'll say just on a, on a broader scale is that most of the providers that would um provide antivirus for pc now have more and more uh, apple uh, apple options um, iOS options now so any I won't name them but a lot of the, the, the big brands there they now have an option available uh, for Mac not sure how many are that out there for charitable discounts well this is still quite new in some areas mm -hmm. but it's sometimes worth asking just to see if there's anything available to charity out there at a discount which can cover your uh, sort of Apple Mac devices as well. No, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, you, you've answered very well to that tricky question. So <laughs> well done. Um, Somebody is asking, uh, so they, they work in, in, in a medical clinic. They don't currently allow nurses on wards to have mobiles, but they need to introduce multi-factor authentication or two-factor auth authentication on systems in order to maintain and pass Cyber Essential Plus, which would then mean that nurses will need to use their their mobile so what are your thoughts on on this um perhaps becca first okay so um you know the reason why multi-factor authentication is really important is because it's becoming so easy for criminals to hack passwords and you know they're they're, they're not sitting there typing everyone individually you know they're using it they're, they're using um software exactly. and they're just running exactly. through it and they can do it so quickly um, and so multi-factor authentication is really, really important in this. You can use something like Google Authenticator or something on, on their phones. I mean, I can't really comment on the clinical reasons why you can't use a phone um, in the clinical setting. Um, but for the security, they're the security reasons is that it in increases that security by quite a significant amount. Um, and it's, it's something that we strongly encourage um, to, so using multi-factor authentication on all the systems that you can. No, absolutely. No, thank you. Um, Joel, I don't know if you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, as just to echo Becca's thoughts, I mean, multi-factor authentication is so important now. I know it can get a little bit annoying at times for being emailed or, you know, is this you? Because I certainly have that on pretty much every one of my devices now, but I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, in terms of medical build of things, I mean, I can understand wanting to be careful with that kind of data, especially with mobiles, you might want to, on top of a more multi-factor authentication, look at sort of device management protection as well. And there are a few organizations out there who, who, who provide that type of thing as well. So it, you would get a license which could protect like multiple devices under one license. So it could protect that, mm -hmm. say that nurse, if they have a, a home, P, uh, sorry, a work PC, but they're also using their, my, uh, their mobile, they, they can get a, a type of license which can uh, provide protection, cover both, uh, cover both and the two-factor authentication on both as well. 
Mm -hmm. So it might be something worth looking into and um, may the, the big, big or super, super massive organizations. I can't remember the technology where it's super large organizations um, out there, software providers um, provide that type of software. Brilliant. Well, thank you both. Um, yes. And, and uh, uh, Dog is, is also, well, mentioning the security token, you know, the, the small, very small token that uh, that sometimes people have that generate uh, a, a password each time that that could also be uh, an option. Um, next question we have is uh, actually a question for, for you, Joel. Um, the question from Adam, how does traditional software discounts compare to the Microsoft 365 nonprofit offering? And obviously, I'm guessing from the question, Microsoft Defender as well. Um, so I don't know if you had some more information you, we can share. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, as you say, yeah, Microsoft provide um, nonprofit software mm -hmm. uh, out there at a discount. Um, and we also do as well. And in some cases, we can provide a further discount on some product lines. Um, programs growing as well, so we can provide other sort of um, parts to that as well. Like there'll be ways of how we can share. Um, we're very into self-learning. Um, so rather than the hand-holding kind of third party side of things, we would like to provide documents of, of how to um, sort of self-teach when it comes to um, learning about the various aspects of 365, including some of its uh, uh, protection software, such as Defender, uh, Enterprise mm -hmm. Mobility and Security as well, uh, which are some, uh, some features in terms of protection wise, which you might find useful. Super. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we had a, 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 another question in clarification, actually, with regards to the NCSC tools. Uh, the mail check and web check um, only seem to be available to pilot users for charities. When will that? When will this be broadened out? Or if you could clarify that for our audience, please. Yeah, I. I so it was over a year ago that the pilot happened. Um, and so over the past year that we've been trying to increase the numbers and assessing like how that's going. So any charity can sign up to WebCheck mm -hmm. or MailCheck now. Um, the reason why they're putting that um, this pilot, it's a pilot, is because they want to get that final decision on whether or not they're going to limit the numbers to, um, I can't remember. I think it's like a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, per, a thousand licenses per um, tool uh, or whether or not they're going to say it for anyone. Um, so please feel free to go and use it. I'm hoping that they're going to make a final decision and take pilot users off the website so that people <laughs> will start using it. <laughs> I have I have been beating that drum as well and saying, can we just say charities can just have it and go for it so please just sign up for it and um yeah the, feel free to use web check mail check there are loads of other really great tools on there early warning um is available to any organization so if there are other organizations that you work with that aren't charities get them to sign up to that because that will if they're helping that will help them to recognize any vulnerabilities and then in line if you're working with them helps to protect you a bit as well they've got exercises on there logging made in the easy i mentioned as well like loads and loads of really good tools. But yes, web check and mail check, feel free to sign up to it. Super. <laughs> Thank you, Becca. It's free as well. Right? This, and it's free. It, it's it, free. It, it, I, the, the thing I've come across this charity sector is that so many charities don't realise how much uh, sort of free support there is out there. I speak to so many who mm. la uh, light bulb goes, this is free, really? So no, <laughs> it's free. Go for it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that that the very last question before before we wrap up um so uh Ruman are saying that their org doesn't receive public donations but what would you say is another common way for attacks to target if there's no donation link okay um so i'm guessing thinking about this is thinking about spoofing mm -hmm. the charity um so you could also be targeted by a denial of service attack so trying to take your website down and um, you could be targeted through a phishing email or a ransomware attack, regardless of whether or not you bring donations in. There are lots of different things that could be of value to um, a criminal. Attacker. Yes. And um, so you've got the ransom. you got they, they, they might want to get a ransom off you if they think that you hold a lot of money. Um, they might be really interested in the data that you're holding. 
um, we're seeing a, an increasing trend of when there's a cyber attack being run that they are uploading data and they can sit they, because they can make extra money so even if you don't pay the ransom they can make mm -hmm. money on the dark net by selling it um and uh there, there may be political reasons why they might want to target you to target to, you as well make, mm -hmm. yeah so in late 2021 and um, the rnli was all over the news because they their website was down from a ddos attack and there was no coincidence that this is a time when um, they were helping a number of refugees cross crossing the channel, the channel. Mm -hmm. yeah and so and that so that's a really good example of where that why there might be some political gain or if you're working um in to support um like maybe some sort of geopolitical reasons we're working to support something like the ukraine crisis or or other sorts of work in other countries they they may want to Disrupt to target you. Disrupt. Yeah. Just, just to make a message, like for a message, or it could mm -hmm. just be that they just nasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've mm -hmm. seen um, dodgy links being added into people's website, into charities' websites. Um, you know, particularly um, charity supporting mm -hmm. vulnerable people, and then links that could trigger those vulnerable individuals being added into the websites, which is yeah, horrible. Just, um, just... so that's something that that WebCheck can help you with as well. We're helping you with that making sure that there, are no, there are no vulnerabilities on your website and no ways that they can try and do that um brilliant yeah there are many ways there are many yes many ways beyond the, the donation will thing be coming out soon i was hoping that the report will be out next week but it may be slightly delayed because you know we've government it needs to be approved in many different mm -hmm. ways um but there will be a threat report coming out soon and it can really help you to understand why charity what might to be look up for how um really great paper as well to go and give to your boards and your trustees and say mm. look we need money for cyber security here this is why i need to do this and this and this because of this um so yeah brilliant yeah, we'll we'll look forward to that <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all we've got time for for today. But uh, thank you very much, Becca and, and Joel, for, uh, uh, for for all of your uh, all of your answers and for for taking the time to to, uh, to to give your replies and to give loads of resources uh, to to our audience as well. So thank you very much to all of you for joining. Uh, we will add all the resources that we've mentioned in the resource tab. The recording will be ready next week. So um, you, you've got uh, all of that ready for for you to share uh, please do continue to follow us on social media twitter and linkedin uh, sign up to our newsletters uh, to keep informed about any upcoming webinar and any upcoming cybersecurity content uh, we've got a great workshop uh, later this month and plenty of uh, other uh, videos and articles uh, that we're creating in partnership with the national Cybersecurity center uh, so so yes yeah, so you're in a good place uh, Anyway, our next webinar will be on the 17th of November and it will be around fundraising trends. Uh, so please do, do tune in for that one. And uh, in the meantime, we, we hope you do take care and we hope to see you again soon.